Hello and welcome to Need to Know, the program that brings you the latest news and analysis on the phenomenon of UAPs, unidentified anomalous phenomena, the subject that can no longer be ridiculed or stigmatised. And I'll just bring in my colleague in crime from Los Angeles, Bryce Zabel. G'day, Bryce. How are you, mate? Good day, Roscoe. Well, I'm great. And uh, I'll tell you something, though. This interview that you did with David Grush, the exclusive interview, has just sent ripples of intensity across the UFO community uh, around the world. And I can't even keep up with all the implications of it. My name is uh, David Grush. You know, I came from a blue collar family in Pittsburgh. I didn't have the money for college. Always admired people in uniform. And I've always wanted to be a part of something bigger than myself. You know, 18 years ago, you know, I got an Air Force scholarship for physics. Uh, I originally commissioned on active duty in the Air Force, uh, served 14 years in the Air Force. I look at this photograph, Dave, and I see a very proud officer. Uh, I was getting promoted to captain when I was uh, deployed. And you still love your country, don't you? Absolutely. After a tour of duty in Afghanistan, Grush moved into the shadowy world of military intelligence. I was an intel officer for the U.S. for 14 years. My last position, which I left in April of 2023, um, I co-led the UAP portfolio for the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency and some of the highest officials within the Department of Defense and Intelligence community used to call on me to advise them on some of the hardest uh, target sets that the country had. You are one of the most trusted former intelligence officials in the US defense and intelligence establishment. Yes, I was. You were trusted with the most intimate secrets. Yes. Well, we're coming up to three weeks now, Bryce, and I'm fascinated by the fact that we have not had a peep from the Pentagon or the intelligence community. There's been absolutely no attempt by the DOD or the IC to lay a glove on the credibility of David Grush. The best we've had to date is a somewhat speculative psychological profile by a bunch of psychologists who think that Dave's body language is deceptive. And um, I just think what they've done is, uh, albeit it's legitimate, I guess, um, it doesn't take into account the um, uh, quite understandable differences between somebody who, on Dave's admission, he's autistic, and he was also talking about the most incredible story in human history. I, I think he can be excused for feeling slightly nervous. And look, while we're talking about Dave, just for the last few minutes, Marco Rubio, Senator Marco Rubio, the Florida senator who sits on the Senate Select Committee for Intelligence, he has just confirmed in an interview with Matt Laszlo that um, David Grush is the first UAP whistleblower who's followed the correct uh, vetting process. He's been credibly vetted and been referred on to Congress. Um, basically, uh, he acknowledged in the question and answer with Matt that um, the Inspector General has seen it as an urgent and credible threat. And so that's how it's been referred to us. And Matt asked, hear from him, would you be um, seeking to depose him behind closed doors? And the Senator replies, well, we've begun that process. Obviously, it's up to the chairman to decide, but we've already begun that process and he's interviewed with staff already. So we have now on the record confirmation from one of the senior members of the Senate Select Committee for Intelligence that David Grush was referred by the Inspector General as an urgent and credible complaint. Um, and more importantly, that the uh, interrogation, the um, depositions have already begun. So uh, it's very important, I think, that people just take a deep breath and let the process in Congress take its course, my friend, because whilst all of us, I think, would like this to be resolved tomorrow and see the president coming to the lectern in the West Wing and making an announcement, I honestly don't think we're ever going to see that unless uh, Congress, the Senate oversight committees do their job properly and take the time to properly depose David Grush and more importantly, follow up on the leads that he's provided them. I'll go you one more. I, I think we eventually are going to see a president have to get to that lectern and, and talk about it. But uh, if it's Biden, he'll have to go kicking and screaming because first, a, a lot of this has to be dealt with. But 
you know, just to follow up on what you were talking about, um, Grush uh, has been acknowledged now by Senator Marco Rubio, but it sounded like he was saying, yes, uh, we want to have him in to tell his story, I guess, again, because I was under the impression he had already spoken to the Senate Intelligence Committee, um, and that would be behind closed doors. Uh, is that what you're hearing? A lot of people are missing this point. As we've repeatedly said, Bryce, yeah. the evidence that David Grush gave to the Senate Select Committee for Intelligence was done only with staffers in the room. You didn't have the senators in the room. Okay. And that's one of the reasons why it's been very difficult for them in the early days, in the first week or so, to make any comment, because they've been reliant on their staffers to essentially brief them on what transpired with Mr. Grush coming forward to the Senate. But my understanding is that Mr. Grush has given evidence under oath to both the House Permanent Select Committee for Intelligence, and some of that was done in front of representatives. But more importantly, he was able to go into a lot more detail with staffers who were appropriately cleared with the high-level security clearances in the Senate Select Committee for Intelligence. And um, yes, we now have official confirmation from Senator Rubio that this is indeed something that was referred properly and correctly vetted uh, and referred properly by the Inspector General to the Senate Select Committee for Intelligence and that it is now being actively investigated by the Senate Select Committee for Intelligence, which is the committee that he presides over. So, for all the hysterical speculation online that uh, Dave Grush is a victim of disinformation, let's just re-emphasize one thing that I think, again, people are missing. In the Inspector General for the Intelligence Community's investigations, the reason for his finding of urgent and credible isn't just based on the assertions of Mr. Grush. It's based on other witnesses that the Inspector General has called in camera in a secure facility where they've been able to depose witnesses and get them to give evidence under oath, and their testimony has backed Mr. Grush. And my understanding is that some of those people who have testified are people who are within the legacy UAP program. And I'm saying this not from information I've derived from Mr. Grush, but from other sources that I have who've told me what they're aware of, which is that there are people from the legacy program coming forward, giving evidence to the Inspector General where they can do that because the IG is sufficiently cleared. One of the problems with the Congress, we do know that there's going to be an oversight committee, the House Oversight Committee uh, hearing, and uh, I think it's called, to be honest, uh, the full name, just so we're clear, is the, um, uh, the House Oversight Committee, and the chairman of that is James Comer. And uh, among the membership, of course, as we know, is Tim Burchett, the Tennessee uh, representative. And uh, he has made it absolutely clear that he would like to have an open public hearing. But um, uh, my understanding is that uh, it's hoped that Mr. Grush will be able to testify. That's certainly Mr. Grush's intention. And it may be because of the level of um, security classification that exists on some of the things that Mr. Grush wants to talk about, the committee will have to go and closed hearing for at least part of the hearing. But my understanding and good on him is that Tim Burchett has made it clear that he'd like as much of the hearing to be as open as possible. I don't have a date yet, but I'm assured that it will be very soon. I suspect sometime in July. Uh, so frankly, things are proceeding as very much I expected them to proceed. Um, we, we have to let the processes of government take their course. One of the, the key questions Bryce, and Marco Rubio was asked this in his press conference, is whether there's going to be hearings, public hearings, held by the Senate Select Committee for Intelligence, because that's the committee that's got the clout. It's got the authority to really dig into this issue. And really, that depends very much on whether the chairman of the committee uh, decides, and I think that's Mark Warner, uh, who's a Democrat, uh, whether he decides that it's legitimate for the committee to hold public hearings. I have to be honest with you and say that I'm sceptical that the Senate Select Committee for Intelligence will be prepared to hold public hearings. And I think this is where the uh, research community and the public interest needs to hold the Congress's feet to the fire. Mr. Grush has made credible and urgent 
allegations, it's incumbent on the Congress to be seen to be properly investigating them. Frankly, it's far too serious. The implications of some of the things that he's alleged, which are criminal in nature, ought properly to be being properly investigated by full committees of the Congress with all members in attendance. Listen, I remain uh, powerfully interested in hearing Dave Grush's compelling testimony that he basically gave to you exclusively on, on camera. I look forward to him being under oath uh, talking in a public hearing and telling at least as much of that story as he can. I think it will go a long way toward uh, getting rid of the people who are talking about his body language and so forth. And by the way, I just have to say, before I go back to the hearings on the body language thing, I watched him do both interviews with you. I, I, you know, uh, I, I look at his body language just fine. He looked like an honest man to me. And I saw him up close and personal. So when I see people saying, well, I've studied the interview that he did, uh, and this is my conclusion. I mean, for crying out loud, imagine that you've given up your career, basically, to turn into a whistleblower, where you're going to talk about the most sensitive information ever in history. And then you go have to talk about it on camera, and you're not a little bit nervous? I mean, hell, if I said what, what Grush said, I'm sure people would be saying that my body language was all wrong. I, I, I saw a man who was telling the truth. But here's the thing about what you were saying. Are we on a track for some kind of dueling hearings? Because it seems like the Senate Intelligence Committee, frankly, has people who are, are bipartisan in nature. And we've talked about that before, that they seem to be bringing a bipartisan sense to this whole thing. Now, over at the House Committee, uh, you know, the two people who are doing it are the most outspoken are Representative Luna and Representative Burchett. And, uh, you know, they are good on the uh, UAP issue, but they're, they're partisan uh, pretty much on most other things. So, I, you know, I just wonder what is the right venue and who determines that? Who is going to determine which committee gets to go first? That's a very good question. And look, frankly, I don't think it's certain that we are going to see public hearings that allow Mr. Grush to say what he would quite like the public to know. Um, the, the, the simple fact is that we are at a very interesting moment in human history. As we talk, there are events unfolding in Moscow that are a serious distraction to uh, the, the leaders in the Senate in particular, who have a huge concern about international relations. And I, I just think, frankly, everything's wiped off the front page right now because my sources in intelligence are telling me that things are in incredibly dangerous right now. We are at an incredibly precarious moment in history where Russia, the Russian Federation, is in danger of falling apart in a coup d'etat. There is a direct challenge by Prigozhin to President Putin. And there are apparently tanks rolling the streets in Moscow. So let's just wait and see what comes out of that. But I can completely understand why members of the, the Senate in particular, who are very driven by their concerns about foreign policy, are distracted right now. And I've been aware for some weeks that the situation in Ukraine is also escalating. You know, there's real concern, for example, that the Russians have placed mines around a nuclear reactor. And uh, if that does result in a um, an explosion, uh, well, I noticed that uh, two very senior members of the Senate have pledged bipartisan that um, this would be regarded as a direct attack on NATO. So we are, frankly, at the moment, Bryce, at a moment in human history oh. where we are possibly in a more dangerous period in terms of the possible deployment of nuclear weapons than, in, in, than at any other time in our history. So I can kind of forgive the people in Congress for being slightly distracted right now. What I what I can tell you is that there are people who are genuinely motivated to get to the bottom of this story. They are doing their job as fast as they can do it. Um, I'm told that uh, uh, there's a couple of things you should keep an eye on. Dean Johnson did a, a fantastic story earlier on this week uh, where he talked about legislation that G uh, Senator Gillibrand has foreshadowed, which in some way is going to compel private aerospace companies to be more forthcoming about any technology that they are holding that is related to UAPs. 
And um, I, I'm told that there is some very interesting legislation coming down the track from Senator Gillibrand that will signal a new toughness by the Senate in particular. And I think also, um, while we're on the subject, I should resolve one thing that people have been asking me a lot online, which is what's happened to the interviews that we've done. And just to explain, Bryce and I have done a, um, if you like, a preparatory interview with Mr. Grush the day before we did the News Nation interview. And at some stage, I think, Bryce, we're going to run that interview. And it's obviously up to our discretion when and if we run that. But the, um, uh, the News Nation interview is News Nation's copyright. One of the compromises I have to make as a freelance investigative journalist is News Nation were good enough to uh, fund, at enormous cost, by the way, the uh, deployment of film crews and the transportation of people to essentially facilitate the interview and then the post production and editing. Tonight, Show and tell, take one. for the first time, a former senior military intelligence officer comes forward to say what we've only imagined is true. You are saying to the human race, for the first time, we are not alone. We're definitely not alone. Claims that our government has proof of alien life. We have spacecraft from another species. We do, yeah. How many? Quite a number. Some are landed, some are crashed. Allegations of a secret government program that's hidden the truth and the technology from the world. There's a sophisticated uh, disinformation campaign targeting the US populace, which is extremely unethical and immoral. And it's totally, totally frightening. From Roswell to the present day. We're going against the wind. The wind's 120 knots to the west. There are non prosaic cases, 100% unexplainable. I mean, this is like tangible technical craft they're seeing. Is this decorated officer a liar? Why should we believe you? A fool. Is it possible that you're deluding yourself? Or a hero? I'm a patriot, and uh, I believe the truth to power in this. Prepare to have your mind blown. We're talking about the biggest secret in human history. We are not alone. The UFO whistleblower speaks. And so that uh, story that they've run, I, I think they've been protecting the copyright of that story online. And frankly, it's their copyright to protect. They're entitled to do that. I'm told they're planning another broadcast of the story at some stage in the near future. And I certainly hope they do. And I'd certainly be encouraging them to run the full or a version of the full interview because I personally think it's extremely interesting. And um, obviously, uh, if they aren't facilitating it, we'll be seeking their permission to run um, longer versions of the Q and I that I the Q and I that I did with Mr. Grush. Um, what I can tell you is that um, uh, I think I speak for both of us, Bryce, we're, we're very determined to get as much of the David Grush interview out as we can possibly get out. And uh, there's no conspiracy. Nobody's hiding anything. Mm. Um, uh, nobody's, I understand, there's not some dark force in the intelligence community that's demanding the video be taken down. It's um, simply a news company that's uh, totally entitled to enforce its copyright. Because people don't understand under fair use provisions in the Copyright Act, you're, a, you're allowed to use bits of a story for uh, comment and analysis, but you, you're not allowed to run the entire story. And uh, I, I can completely understand why News Nation is protecting their copyright. It's, um, it's something they have to do. And uh, I'm hoping at some stage they'll both run the story again in its entirety. And I know they're contemplating doing that. And I'd certainly like to see the full interview being run as well. I would have preferred a different outcome with News Nation, where uh, they had the right to run that show first, and then uh, Ross had the right to do whatever he wanted with the rest of the interview. That didn't happen, and uh, I wish it had. I want to take a moment, though, and explain to people a little bit more about uh, the so-called seven hours of, of interview, because... Uh, there is a lot of confusion. Here's what happened from my point of view. Um, I had, had been talking with Ross uh, for a long time about the whistleblower. I didn't know him by name. And then uh, in May, uh, it became clear it was Dave Grush. And uh, Ross and uh, Dave Grush came to Los Angeles in early May. And um, 
the way this worked is on May 8th, there was a decision to, uh, you know, he was going to speak to the, to Ross for the News Nation people on May 9th. On May 8th, what happened is there was a decision that, hey, maybe he'll get nervous and he won't want to do this or something will come up or God forbid, uh, we show up at the News Nation interview on May 9th and uh, there's federal marshals there to arrest him and take him away. I mean, we just weren't sure. So there was a sort of a feeling at that lunch we had that we ought to try to get him on tape as a safety copy, if nothing else, that that we would have some tape made. So we kind of went into overdrive on that afternoon. And uh, literally, I called my son, who's a filmmaker, uh, Jared Zabel, and I said, hey, uh, grab your camera, come on over to the house, and let's do this interview. So we put Dave on, uh, on tape for a couple of hours, as I recall it. So you've spoken to people with direct knowledge yes. of a secret legacy UFO program. Correct. You're saying that the United States government has retrieved alien technology. Yes, the assessment was non-human, presumably extraterrestrial, but we do have retrieved non-human material and craft uh, that we have in our possession. Do we have alien bodies? We do. And then, of course, the next day, uh, there was the News Nation uh, interview that Ross did. And, you know, from my feeling, it felt like about three and a half hours that tape was rolling. So it, in an earlier edition of Need to Know, I made the uh, comment that like, well, there's like seven hours of tape, which is something I shouldn't have quite said, because if you think about it, you got the May 8th interview that was done at my house. You have the May 9th interview that was done at News Nation. They're very duplicative. I mean, Ross, you were uh, interviewing from your same notes. They're very similar. Now, the difference is, uh, obviously, uh, people, uh, Dave in general, had a chance to think about how he wanted to say things. And and frankly, as I look at it, the, the News Nation interview is very smooth and, and it's wonderful. And I, I wish that there will be a way where it gets worked out that people can see it. But under no circumstances are there seven hours of top quality interview, because even in the News Nation three and a half hours, uh, as as Ross will attest in a second, there's a lot of, there's some hemming and hawing. There's people that need to fix the lighting. Uh, there's a microphone that's not working. Uh, people need to take a bathroom break. There's just a lot of things that happen. So I don't think there's three and a half hours of, of just beautiful, succinct, clear Dave Grush conversation. So uh, there's less of it, but there's still some stuff that hasn't been seen. And I in, am in favor of the transparency of letting people see it. But I do want to back up, Ross, on one thing. It's not like um, people shoot something and then say, and now we're going to put it all out. I mean, what Ross was trying to do is find a platform that would help get the Dave Grush story out there in the best possible way. I mean, uh, first of all, we would have had to shoot it entirely instead of News Nation. They did a beautiful job. But second of all, you want the platform to be good and you want the quality to be good. So I think things have gone about the way you might expect them to go. And I want to assure everybody who's listening to this that if you saw uh, the one hour special called We Are Not Alone on News Nation, where Ross interviewed Dave Grush, you have hit the highlights. Now, are there some other things he might have said? Yes. Uh, are there some other uh, things where he added to some of his answers? Yes. But the highlights are there. Uh, so I just want everyone to feel like no one is out. As Ross said, there aren't any government agents that have, are, are preventing this from getting out. There's only the idea that it all needs to work, be worked out among people who, who uh, as you said, own the copyright. But here's what's interesting. And here's what Ross and I can say to you at home. News Nation did pay for the cameraman, they paid for the crew, and they found the location. And so based on the understanding uh, that Ross had with News Nation, they control how that tape is to be used. However, we shot the day before, and nobody controls that tape but us. And when and if the time becomes necessary to put out that, we're going to do it, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So I'm glad we've resolved that because I think there's yeah. a lot of conspiracy theories starting to emerge online that, frankly, 
uh, unwarranted. Now, there's a couple of things I think need addressing. Um, uh, our good friend Chris Sharp from Liberation Times has written a very good story this week. Uh, it was posted on the 22nd, and he was talking about quotes from Susan Goff, the Pentagon PR person, who has asserted that there is no restriction to URO, that's the Pentagon's UAP investigation office, receiving any part or present UAP-related information. And essentially, it was intended as a rebuttal to David Grush's claims that he was the victim of reprisals when he was working on the separate body, the UAP task force. Now, I've double-checked this with certain sources, and I am assured that the key word in that response from Susan Goff is receiving, that there is no restriction to Arrow receiving any information. It's the difference between proactive and reactive. David Grush, when he was on the UAP task force, was proactive. He put on his boots and he went out and followed up leads, which is what we all want. We want this properly investigated. And that's what David Grush set out to do. And this is why I think ARO is actually, frankly, set up to fail. It's essentially an organization that is presiding over a cover-up, an active attempt at a cover-up. You've got Susan Goff from the Pentagon asserting that there is no restriction to ARO receiving, and that's reliant on people coming forward. What David Grush was doing was proactively going into these programs and seeking to interview people in those programs who wanted to allow him access to see what they knew. And it's what he found, I understand, which has led to his reprisal allegation, that when he sought access to what those people were telling him about, he was denied access by the intelligence community and the DOD. So I'm sorry, I, I do think that um, uh, Susan Goff from the Pentagon is being disingenuous in what she asserts here because she's not telling the whole story. Um, she also um, uh, makes much of the fact that um, uh, they could, if they want in the future, apply for what's called Title 10 or Title 50 access, supplementary statutory authorities for RO that would give them access to access certain secrets. And the interesting thing is I've double-checked this this morning. I'm, I'm assured that Sean Kirkpatrick, the head of RO, if he doesn't have it already, he's probably already got Title 50 access. Uh, but if he doesn't have it already, one of the difficulties for RO at the moment is he actually reports directly to the head of the intelligence community, Ron Moultrie. And if the allegations are true that there is essentially a cover-up going on in the intelligence community, one would assume that Ron Moultrie would know about this. So I just question whether Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick has indeed asked yet for Arrow to be given the Title 10, Title 50 access so that it can proactively go and investigate and not just knock on doors and say, oh, can I come in, but kick that door in and find out what's on the other side, because that's what we need. And I, I just want to also point out, uh, there's a very good final paragraph in um, Chris Sharp's story where he makes the point that Lou Elizondo has previously raised concerns about the fact that the UAP investigations bodies in the Pentagon, including ARO, report to USDI, the Office of the Undersecretary for Defence Intelligence. And as Lou has previously said, USDI is the one office that has continuously lied about this topic and persecuted whistleblowers. And it's noted in Chris's story that the National Defence Authorization Act of 2023 means or perhaps requires that the ARO, the Pentagon's UAP investigation body, should report instead to the Deputy Director, the Deputy Secretary of Defence, Kathleen Hicks on all operational and security matters relating to the ARO. But Chris Mo notes, this has not yet been implemented, meaning that the ARO still reports to the Office of the Undersecretary for Defence Intelligence and Security. And I'm sorry to sound all technical, and I, I just want you to know why this matters is because essentially it's setting ARO up for failure. Why would the body that's investigating UAPs actively investigate something that might reveal that people in the Office of the Undersecretary for Defence, Intelligence and Security are involved in perhaps a criminal cover-up. That's what we're talking about here. That's the There's implication. A, 
There's so much to unpack in what you just said. One of the things that I have a question about, though, is I read uh, Susan Goff's statement and the, you know, without, I didn't have a detailed analysis. I just thought she's not really saying the Department of Defense doesn't have access to all this. She's saying Arrow doesn't, which is very different. If Arrow and its leader did not have Title 50 access and and it turns out that David Grush did, then he would know more than Arrow, which is supposed to be investigating it. Or do I have this wrong? S straighten me out, Ross. What, what, what's the deal? I, I mean, I've, I've always thought it's very, very disingenuous for her to make this statement that um, Arrow to date has not discovered any ver ver verifiable information yes. to substantiate claims that any programs regarding the possession or reverse engineering of extraterrestrial materials have existed in the past or exist currently. Of course, Arrow hasn't discovered it because, frankly, I don't think Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick well, has an interest in discovering it. And, and, and I don't think the people was, that he, I don't think go, the go people ahead. that he answers to, I don't think that Uzdi have any interest in exposing this because if there is, as we suspect there is, an active cover-up going on inside the Defence Department and the intelligence community. Why? Ask yourself, why? Why would the head of the Pentagon's UAP investigation program do something that would not please his masters? I just don't think they're, they're allowing the Arrow to do its job properly. And I think it should be answering directly to the Secretary for Defence. And I think we really have to bite the bullet and ask why. Congress needs to ask why. Why has what was required in the National Defence Authorization Act not yet been put into law? Just in case uh, people are just joining us, Arrow is the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office. It's a new office. And Ross, I'll tell you something. When I read Susan Goff's statement, I asked myself, if you took Arrow out of that statement and put Department of Defense into it, could she have issued the same statement? I don't think so. Because yeah, we know, either. well, I know, I know for a fact there are people in the Department of Defense who know about the legacy yeah. crash retrieval program. Um, there are people in the Department of Defense who know about a reverse engineering program that is hidden behind waived, unacknowledged special access programs that, as Mr. Grush apparently alleges in his complaint to the Inspector General, he was denied access to. And I, I think at the heart of all of this, my friend, is the big question. Does Congress have the bottle? Will the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, will the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence have the bottle to actually ask the questions, to shake the, 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 the corridors of power and get to the truth of this matter? Okay. I'm not 100% sure that I they will. I have to just break in here and say we're having one of those Australian-American moments. Um, I've never heard have the bottle. What does this mean? <laughs> Sorry, it's um, having the <laughs> having the courage. Um, having it's, a, the it's, courage. It's, it's it's a reference to Dutch courage, you know. Um, uh, yes, basically, yes. Uh, the uh, I love it. No, listen, <laughs> I'm learning so much from this podcast. I'm not learning anything about UFOs, but I'm learning a lot about uh, uh, Australian American relations. Hey, listen, here's the thing that I think we have to dial back to. You said it at length in our last episode, and you've you've touched on it in this one, which is the idea that criminality exists, it's not just that UFOs are a very big deal and they, they change the nature of reality and how we see ourselves in the universe. It's also that criminality has been committed in keeping this secret. But Russ, when you've said it, we've sort of danced around it. We haven't been specific. And I've had a few people uh, talk to me about it. They want to know, what do we mean by criminality? Are we saying murders that were committed to keep a secret? Or what, are, what criminality are we potentially alleging here? As you will have seen in my interview with David Grush, one of the allegations that I put to Mr. Grush in his TV interview was, have people been killed? murdered to protect this secret. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't really expect David to answer in the affirmative. But what he told me was that he has a strong suspicion based on the interviews that he's done with people whom he says told him they were part of the legacy program. They, they have strong grounds for suspicion that people have been murdered. Now, that's an allegation of criminality by any definition. 
Um, the other thing too is um, he's directly acknowledged that to his knowledge, there've been financial uh, illegalities perpetrated in his opinion, that, that there's been attempts to hide things off the books. And more importantly, it's a contempt of the Congress at fundamentally at the heart of sure. all of this, if the accountability controls in America still matter, and sometimes I wonder, but if those accountability controls in America still matter, one of the great things about your constitution is it has these checks and balances built into it because the fathers of the constitution, the people who wrote the American constitution, were writing with a very recent memory of the tyranny of English kings, who frankly just did whatever the hell they wanted, locked people up in jail arbitrarily, stole people's property without any compensation. And this American constitution was born out of a recognition that there needed to be checks and controls on abuses of power. And if it is the case that Congress is still ultimately the top power in America, it has the right to inquire into allegations of criminality, such as those made by David Grush. Illegalities, the assumption that there's been money diverted for causes and purposes that the Congress well, have not been properly accounted for. Um, those are things that are, if indeed there's been an attempt to subvert that accountability, that is a contempt of the Congress. And and this is why this matters. I'm I'm yeah. sorry. I probably sound like an old law student, or a, but you know I've, I I was schooled in your beautiful constitution. The American Constitution is a beautiful document, and it it enshrines laws and rights and powers, and it recognizes that Congress is essentially sovereign. It it controls your government, and it's not the Pentagon that controls the government. It's not the intelligence community that controls the government. It's the Congress. And when I say Congress needs to find the bottle, it needs to find the courage to actually start rattling the cage and asking these questions. Because I'm not persuaded that it's going to. I think at the moment there are so many distractions internationally, Russia, Ukraine, China, Taiwan, Iran, will Iran build a nuclear weapon by the end of this year and will the Israelis let them? We're in a a period of international history where we're slowly, whether we like it or not, moving towards a possible conflagration, and God forbid that it goes nuclear. And the the thing is, I can kind of understand why the national security establishment is distracted right now, and they, they don't want to have to account for the fact that they've been lying through their teeth for decades yeah. about recovered technology. And um, I, 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 I'm not making excuses for them, but I can see why there is prevarication inside the Congress about whether now is a good time. Well, I mean, <clears throat> it's hardly a slow news day, as we say in the uh, broadcast news business. I mean, with all the things you just mentioned, and I, I honestly believe we need to take that into consideration. This is a, look, nobody picks their timing, okay? This UFO issue has been boiling for 80 years, 70 years at a high boil. And uh, this may just be the time where it's it's due to come out. Uh, you don't pick your time. Uh, it's not great. The whole Ukraine thing, uh, Iran, you know, all the things that you could talk about that are going on. It is uncomfortable to drop UFOs into it, and that's uh, a subject we will be talking about quite often uh, here on the Need to Know podcast. But I just had one other thought about uh, potential illegality. I know that we have a lot of laws in the United States uh, about how the Defense Department is supposed to, for example, spend its money. Uh, if you want to build a, a bomber, uh, you're supposed to have a competitive bidding situation going on. So I wonder if it's illegal to, if you have, if the U.S. government had a craft of non-human origin uh, or crafts and they favored one aerospace company over others, uh, maybe Lockheed Martin got it, but nobody else did or something like that. I think that's probably illegal too, just on the technicality. Don't you think, Ross? Well, I think this is one of the reasons why this story is coming to the surface, because I know there are people in corporations that, and I've spoken to some of them, who um, 
feel that there was an unfair decision made back around the 1960s, the 1970s, to farm out technology that had been recovered to certain aerospace companies. One of them was Lockheed Martin. Let's let's not be shy about this. Lockheed Martin's yeah. in this up to its fingernails. You know, it's uh, <laughs> it's 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 probably sitting on the technology we're talking about. And the um, and the the interesting thing is that uh, if you're a uh, particularly a Silicon Valley company of um, great wealth uh, and capabilities with some of the brightest people in the world, and you know that these aerospace companies have basically been sitting on this technology for years and doing very little successfully with it, I think you're perfectly entitled to question. One of the other issues too, my friend, that I'm told is that a lot of the alleged recoveries, and this is new, I'm just about to reveal something new here. I just want to flag to our audience, this is significant, what's coming. I am told that a number of the recoveries were done by private aerospace. And so the issue then is, this is not necessarily US government technology. And there's a question as to the intellectual property. I, I think quite properly, if these companies have spent money, time and resources in, in, in essentially retrieving this technology, perhaps with the assistance of the US government and with its sanction, but if they've spent the time and the money, who owns that IP? And does the US government have the right to demand access to it? Personally, I think that um, in the interests of um, the public interest, I, I think the the Congress, at the very least, should be being informed. Oh. There's also the fact that the US government, I'm told, has directly been involved in crash retrievals and that then technology has been passed on to private aerospace. But again, in that circumstance, if a private aerospace company has been working on this technology for 50, 60 years, 70 years, what right does the state have to then come back and say, you know, that spaceship we gave you 60 years ago, um, can we have it back, please? Or can we at least know what you've done with it? And, um, you know, we'd quite like to share that with, um, I don't know, Apple, Google, you know, whoever, uh, Elon Musk. You know, I, mean, I, I can understand there's an, there's an issue here of um, intellectual property that, that, that is not an easy one for government to resolve. And that's why I think everybody needs to look very, very closely at the legislation that Senator Gillibrand is bringing into the House. Uh, I noticed Dean, Dean Johnson's foreshadowed it, but um, uh, you know, are we going to see the beginnings of an impatience with the unwillingness of private aerospace to be forthcoming with what it has? And is there a risk that those private aerospace companies might try to divest themselves well, of what it is that they have before they get caught with it. You know, we are living in interesting times. It's not impossible, based on what you say, that the government, I believe the government should say, give us these things back, even if they gave them to them, but that's just me. But uh, I believe the government will ask for them back if that's the case then that means that uh, the whole thing could, as many things do in this country, end up in the Supreme Court. Can you imagine a Supreme Court case where a private aerospace company has taken their complaint that the government has illegally retaken a craft that they gave them back in the past? I mean, that's that's crazy stuff. But, I, you know, as you were talking, Russ, a couple of things hit me. One is if private aerospace uh, not only was given craft, but in fact is has retrieved their own. That would mean that instead of U.S. government soldiers, you might have Blackwater-style security teams that have been part of crash retrieval, which raises so many questions uh, that that uh, that could be a whole show. But I, I do think that what we ought to be telling people is it is entirely possible that it isn't just the government trying not to tell people things. It may be that this secret has been so heavily compartmentalized over the years, increasingly so every year, that vast spaces in the government knew nothing about it, and they are legitimately trying to figure out something about it. And that blows my mind, but I believe that's possible. And then um, as we were talking about things that people are allowed to uh, to know and, and shy about revealing, Ross. I think you use the word shy. Okay, something hit me about 
uh, your reporting on Dave Grush and uh, the other reporting. Let me remind everybody the way this went down is Ross did those interviews at the first of May. And because of something, Dave, Dave Grush wanted to allow the print story to break first and then Ross do the exclusive uh, interview. And originally that was going to be the Wall Street Journal. And then the Wall Street Journal took Excuse me. The, well, the New York Times, excuse me. It starts with the W. Uh, the Washington Post was going to do it. They took their three weeks or so. Well, literally, you had in the can this exclusive interview and you're waiting for the Washington Post to decide if they're in or out. And then ultimately they decide they're out and and so does uh, The Hill and so does Politico. And then it ends up um, you know, being broken in the debrief. Now, here's something that I find to be very interesting. The reporters who wrote the debrief article and, and had taken it to those various uh, journalistic institutions first were Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal. And I saw an interview uh, that Leslie Kane had done where she literally almost took umbrage that somebody would expect that if she'd heard about bodies being recovered, it should be in her report. It wasn't in her report. There was nothing in that debrief report about bodies. But Dave Grush, in his interview with you, Ross, did talk about bodies. And there's another reporter, a Michael Schellenberger, who has written on this topic too, who also said that he voluntarily did not include in his report the concept that bodies had been recovered. All right. So you have Leslie Kane, Michael Schellenberger, both of whom are legitimate investigative reporters, both of whom said, well, I'm not going to go there and talk about bodies in this story. Why not? Ross, I don't get it. If, if, if I knew for a fact that there was a whistleblower who was a legitimate individual making these claims and they told me that bodies had been recovered, That'd be my lead. I, I don't understand it. Can you explain how this whole thing lays out? Well, I mean, I can tell you, I, I, I was shocked when David admitted to me that we were talking about bodies being recovered. And he actually made that comment that, well, we're talking about craft and normally there are people that pilot craft. And so, yep. yes, we've recovered bodies from those craft. And journalistically, I I, I do. I, I think that's a very legitimate thing to raise. And frankly, um, of course, I was going to ask the question. I mean, <laughs> what, what are we suggesting here? I mean, I, I've got the utmost respect for Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal, and um, I'm fast getting respect for Michael Schellenberger because he's clearly talking to some very well-informed sources. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't understand what they were thinking about when they said that they voluntarily decided not to mention bodies. I'm, I'm hoping none of them are, are sort of adjusting their stories according to what they perceive the public can deal with. Maybe it's the sense that too much of an ontological shock might be too confronting for people and we have to let them in slowly. But is that a journalist's job? I I don't know. But look, you know, I think people would have to ask Ralph and, um, and Leslie and Michael Schellenberger what was going on in their minds. Uh, it's not even clear in my mind whether they actually asked uh, David, about the bodies question. Um, I, I, they've never clarified. But frankly, my position is it's entirely journalistically legitimate. I wouldn't be doing right. my job. I wouldn't be doing my job. If somebody tells me that it's been recovered craft, of course, the first question you're going to ask is, um, if there were craft, were there bodies? I I so agree with you. The, the idea that journalistically, you should somehow stay away from that. I because it might be too much ontological shock. I mean, for crying out loud, I mean, even subtracting bodies out of the equation, you got a guy saying there has been crash uh, wreckage. There have been retrievals by uh, groups that are charged with doing that. There have been intact craft recovered and that there's reverse engineering going on. I mean, oh yeah, but we don't want to tell you about the bodies. I'm sorry. Uh, I don't, I don't buy that at all. Uh, I, I can't comprehend why it wasn't in the written report. Uh, and and frankly, uh, as the journalist in me is screaming to go find out more about that because the truth is craft are interesting. And in fact, I suppose if you're a military guy, 
the craft may be the most interesting thing because that's technology and you can use and understand and learn from technology and apply it to uh, creating uh, systems that make you uh, uh, more of a threat to your own enemies. And as you just said, we're in a really tough time here on planet Earth, so I can understand that. But the bodies tell us something entirely different. They tell us literally we're not alone in the universe because look, that person, that creature, that individual, that NHI, whatever you want to call them, they're not us. A technology can come from different places. So I, I just don't get it. And uh, I'm going to ride this body thing. I'm not giving up on it. I don't think you are either. People can expect to hear more about it here. Yeah, I mean, I don't think we should be censoring ourselves as journalists and not talking no. about cert certain aspects of the phenomenon because we're worried that it might be so confronting that people won't believe it. Uh, it's not up to us to um, make a story more believable by adding or withdrawing evidence. The only thing to do is to actually include the evidence that is pertinent to the story. Can I give you another example too, Bryce, of an area yes. where I think the media is displaying a dismaying lack of curiosity? Um, there was a, a great drop this week from um, Jeremy Cordell and George Knapp. It was a, a, a letter written by Larry Maguire, MP, back in um, March this year. I've known about this letter for some months, and um, <clears throat> a, a lot of us, of us were surprised, actually, that it came public uh, in the last week or so. But look, frankly, now that it's out, we can talk about it. Um, it's a letter from Larry Maguire, who's a Canadian MP, and he actually told the Minister of Defence in Canada in a letter which is not classified, so there's no security classification on it, that um, firstly, he was aware through meetings with American officials that there had been um, hearings with government and military subject matter experts on the recovery and exploitation of physical material from UAPs. Um, he raised his concerns that it it the there could be quote expected upcoming public announcements to be coordinated between AUKUS, the Australia UK US agreement, which could damage Canada's credibility with our allies on the global stage. And um, he also said. As Minister of National Defence, you may not be aware Defence Research and Development Canada, that's DRDC Canada, has participated in efforts to analyse UAP, which is current, which is publicly traceable to circa 1950. This recovered foreign material is studied through the Five Eyes Foreign Material Program, the FMP, which in Canada is sponsored by the Canadian Forces Intelligence Command, aligned with several intelligence sharing arrangements and treaties. I am writing to recommend you request a classified briefing containing full sensitive and protected program information from your officials on the Government of Canada's historical and ongoing efforts on analysing recovered UAP material. Now, Bryce, just to emphasise, I know a lot about this case. I know a lot more than said in that letter. What Mr. McGuire is saying is correct. Canada has been secretly involved in a reverse engineering program of retrieved non-human technology with the United States of America. And what astounds me is this letter can become public. And as Jeremy Corbell and George Knapp have been screaming from the rooftops in the last week or so, wake up, people. This wake is a up. very, very, very important letter. It's essentially an acknowledgement by a member of the Parliament of Canada that he knows something about Canada's collaboration in efforts to analyse UAP. That's not something he's derived from newspaper clippings or speculative books. It's a briefing he's derived from individuals that he has spoken to. And I, I, I know there are good journalists in Canberra who are, as Can, Canada who are starting to dig into this, and I'm just hoping they can get to the bottom of it because there is a very interesting trail there where if they dig, they oh. will find. You know, Ross, part of what's going on here is there is so much going on, I can barely keep up with it. And it's literally my job right now to try to keep up with it. There's just so much going on. Listen, I know we're getting, and, and by the way, uh, 
hats off again to uh, Corbell and Knapp for, for breaking that letter out. That's a really powerful uh, piece of evidence. You are alleging that the US government has been concealing the existence on this planet of alien life. I would couch it as non-human intelligence, you know, NHI, like we would like to say in our, our language. Why do you say that? Why do you say NHI? I don't want to necessarily denote origin. I don't think we have all the data to say, oh, they're coming from a certain a certain location. And I and I, I couch it as somebody who studied physics where maybe they're coming from a different physical dimension as described in quantum mechanics. We know there's extra dimensions due to high, uh, high energy particle collisions, et cetera, and there's a theoretical framework to explain that, yeah. Just let me cut to the quick, though. Mm -hmm. You're saying there is an intelligent species engaging with this planet. Yes, that's potentially extraterrestrial, yeah. <laughs> I speak for everybody sitting yeah. at home. That is a shock. It was to me, and uh, I had a lot of sleepless nights. I know we're out of time. So what I'm going to do is I just have a couple of final concluding thoughts I wanted to lay out there on the table, and then you can do the same and, and we can take it on home. Um, I, I like to think that I've had an extraordinary month or more now where I got to meet Dave Grush. I got to be a participant uh, in, in observing this historic moment where Ross put him exclusively on television, uh, it was something. And my conclusion is, for what it's worth, Dave Grush is telling the truth. Now, I know uh, we are still at a place where we have to prove that and uh, to the satisfaction of people. And I believe that that ultimately is going to happen. But for me, I see the man as a truth teller. Secondly, Ufology, if you want to call it that, over the years has historically been obsessed with one thing, trying to prove that UFOs are real. I mean, if you look at most UFO books over the years, they've been only one thing, prove UFOs are real. Um, I think we are starting to move beyond that. We don't know everything about them. We don't know who these other individuals are that are piloting them. We don't know... Um, all of that, but we are rapidly moving to a place where it's not about proving they're real, it's about understanding them and, and trying to analyze what it's going to mean for the future that we're all about to live in. And I have to say, candidly, in this last month, honestly, folks, I've had more than a few moments where I literally just have to sit down in my quiet house and start to contemplate what's really happening here? And, and what does it mean to me? What does it mean to you? What about my family? You know, I have children. What's their world going to look like? Is this world going to be a better one or a worse one? And frankly, is there anything that any of us can do to impact that? I just have so many questions swirling around. So the one thing I just want to lay out there is, um, I may not be the world's greatest investigative journalist. I try, and I've certainly done my share of it. But I try to be in touch with my feelings. And I know a lot of you must be starting to feel the things that I'm feeling, where you ask yourself, what's happening? Is this real? If this is real, I can't even believe this. And I'm going to try to be there and go on that journey with you. I mean, I guess that's my pledge. I. I, I feel like it's time for us to look to the future, even as we cover this story in the present. And, um, and Ross, I got to tell you, um, I blame you for all this because you're the guy that introduced me to Dave Grush. Although I knew this, I've known, I've known much of what he said for 30 years, but to hear him say it and to be going on television shows talking about it, man, this has been quite a life-changing experience, really. I don't have this utopian ideology that this is going to, you know, solve world problems, stop war entirely. But all I want is a moment of pause and, and to see if the subject unites us as we've obviously become more divided over the last couple of decades. Because if anything else, what you're revealing may mean we all start thinking of ourselves not as American, Australian, Russian, Chinese, but as human. Human family. I think that's... Uh, totally the right term, yeah. I mean, I still think, as a journalist, this is the biggest story 
of human history. It's, it's massive. The implications of what Mr. Grush is alleging are enormous. If he's telling the truth, what we are talking about is a paradigm shift in humanity's understanding of its origins and our place in the universe. Uh, it's the end of a humanocentric view of the world. Um, it's exciting because it offers the possibility that we may be able to harness new technologies. And I think at the heart of all of this is a vexing question. Why the secrecy? Why has this been kept under wraps? We now know, after years of denial by the US Air Force in particular, that the phenomenon is real. We've been lied to. As David Grush has told us, there's been a long disinformation effort by the US intelligence community to treat this subject with ridicule and taboo. And even now, three weeks into David Grush's allegations being made public, most of the mainstream media is still failing to engage with this topic. Why have the New York Times, with a couple of rare exceptions in their op-ed pages, the New Washington Post, and all of the major newspapers in America failed to engage with this subject. Similarly, with the top three networks in the US, NBC, ABC, CBS. What's going on here? Is it because they're so captive to the national security establishment that they feel that they can't offend their sources by asking entirely legitimate questions? Because we are now at a burden of proof where, as Michio Kaku, the respected and renowned physicist, has said, the burden of proof is now on the debunkers to prove the opposite. And I, I think we're at a really interesting moment in human history here because, as I've said earlier, the big test for me is going to be whether the Congress does its job. Is it just going to sweep this back under the carpet and rely on the fact that it's not getting traction in some of the mainstream media? Is it going to try and sweep it back under the carpet? And I, I can warn you, if they try and do that, it's dangerous because it was, it's in the long run, it's going to, I think, contaminate the institutions of government, because the public perception of a government that continues to maintain a cover-up is not a good one. Here is a great opportunity for a leader, a true leader, to come out and publicly acknowledge what is very quickly becoming very, very clear, um, that David Grush is telling the truth, yeah. and that his allegations should be fully investigated, and that the programs that are being hidden should be exposed. And the aerospace companies that are concealing non-human technology should be outed. Uh, this is not going to go away. And despite the very considerable efforts by sections of the intelligence and defense community to essentially backlash and play down the whole story with ridicule and stigma and contempt, it's still here. And after three weeks, nobody has laid a glove on Dave Grush's credibility. So it's incumbent now on the Congress to properly investigate. Well, Ross, thanks for being my partner on this journey. I can't wait to see where it all ends. I guess we say goodnight, but we're, we're not done. We'll be back with more.